Welcome, everybody, to May I Interrupt, an eye care roundtable discussion uh, that will be very interesting and excited, and we're happy that our sponsors, Oculus, are allowing us to participate in this little game show uh, that we have. We will have questions that we're going to be asking our panelists, which are experts from around the world of contact lenses. Uh, and uh, truly interesting folks on their own right at many different uh, levels. I'm Craig Norman. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jason Jedlicka, the fellow that is making funny hand gestures right now. Uh, and our two guests today are just fantastic. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Wu, a world expert in the specialty contact lens world. Uh, Dr. Wu lives in Las Vegas, Nevada, and recently opened up a specialty contact lens practice there that focuses only on the fitting of contact lenses. Stephanie, how are you? Doing great, Craig. Thanks for having me and thanks to Oculus for having me. This is going to be really fun. Oh yeah, we're really excited to uh, have you here. Your counterpart for today uh, is Dr. Barry Iden, and uh, Dr. Iden is from uh, just north of Chicago where he has really a phenomenal contact lens practice that has been in place uh, for, I believe, three decades or close to it at this point. It's exactly the opposite of Dr. Wu, who has just opened a brand new practice, and Dr. Iden, who is a, a veteran of this. Uh, he also is a world expert on many things in contact lenses. Uh, you just need to ask him, and he'll let you know that that's the case. And he's very good at many things regarding both uh, contact lenses, instrumentation, practice management. Barry, how are you, my friend? Well, I was good until that introduction. So now I'm just like feeling old and uh, we'll see how things go. But I think I started our practice uh, the day that Stephanie was born, maybe <laughs> a couple of days after. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> that is great. So here's the format for today. We are going to talk uh, about a couple of uh, areas. We're going to pose questions to our contestants, which is the uh, three people I just introduced. Uh, those questions will be rated uh, as far as how good they are, and those ratings will take place at the discretion, the discretion of uh, me. So if I like the answer, you're going to hear something that really sounds terrific. They'll get a point. We will mark that point down, and at the end of each of three rounds that we have today, we will count those points up uh, and declare a winner, a champion. At the end of uh, each of those rounds, we will stop that round with the boxing bell. That'll be the clue to do not talk any further. You may get points subtracted at that point if you continue to talk. Uh, so... We're going to go ahead and get Wait, started here. Craig, is that, was that geared specifically for me, right? Uh, yes, that sir. Portion? You are now negative yeah. one for <laughs> interrupting. The title of this is May Interrupt, but not me. You can interrupt the other guys, but every time you interrupt me, it is a demerit, Dr. Iden, a demerit. Something it's you were probably more. really common on getting when you were going through school. Okay, so here, here we go. So the first area of discussion, and I'm going to talk, um, begin with Dr. Iden on this, and uh, we will let you know when your time is up, uh, and then allow one of the other two uh, uh, participants for today. Uh, Barry, looking ahead five years from now in the specialty contact lens field, where do you think we will be at? In your mind, if you had a wish list, or if you can just project, where will we be with lenses, instruments, techniques, whatever they might be? You know, Craig, I think what's going on today, what we're all living through in terms of the challenges of COVID-19 are actually just pushing things along faster, I believe, than ever before to a direction that we'll all be uh, practicing differently over the years to come. And that really relates to virtual contact lens evaluation, fitting, design. Um, you know, all of us have been working in this area quite a bit. I know I've done a lot of stuff with Jason over the last couple of years in this regard, and things are starting to move definitely more exponentially in that area. So I think this sort of automated um, contact lens fitting and uh, designing is really going to be where that's at. Um, the other thing that I think is 
something that we have to keep in our minds is the fact that um, specialty contact lenses by definition are changing. What we consider a specialty today may be considered more conventional just a, couple, a year or two or three from now. We, I'm old enough, as you well know, to remember when astigmatic correcting soft lenses were considered specialty lenses. That's not the case anymore, obviously. So that's going to be something uh, that I think is going to bring us to that point in the future. It's going to change quite a bit. Instrumentation-wise, um, again, I think a number of things are going to change. Um, the software is going to become more robust. We're going to get AI involved um, in not only uh, diagnostics, uh, but also in therapeutic uh, decision making. And I think that's going to be a huge change in our particular profession and in all the medical professions. Um, I think that we have to move towards multifunctionality in instruments. That's huge because space is going to be a premium. We're going to be doing a lot more things remotely. We're going to be doing it with less uh, help, with less space. And so I think that's, that's really huge in that area. Excellent. Dr. Wu. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with everything Barry has said. Um, I also think that myopia control is going to be a big thing in the next few years as we see it is becoming such an epidemic throughout the world. So I definitely think myopia control and some of the different techniques, whether it is contact lenses or other measures, is going to be huge. I definitely think profilometry is going to become more of a standard. I kind of think of it like when topographers first came out, that was something that once we started using a topographer, it was really hard to go back uh, to not having a topographer. Same thing with profilometry, looking at the profile of the sclera has been so huge for my practice and most everybody that has profilometers. It's like you can't practice without them. Um, as far as lens materials go, there's always going to be improvement. I think we've got some amazing materials now, but I do think there will be other coatings that come out. Um, other treatment options onto the lenses, as well as other materials that just continue to evolve. Even with the best materials and coatings, there's still, I think, improvement to be done in the space of dry eye, because we are learning so much about dry eye that I think that once we know more about that, we'll be able to integrate that with some other material options in the future as well. Do you see any combinations of materials that dreaming up if you had a choice of the ultimate contact lens material what would that be yeah so of course you want to have something with high amounts of oxygen especially for things like scleral lenses which are covering the entire cornea but uh, I, I do think that there is still improvement for dry eye um, lipid related mucus related type issues I just still see even with the best coatings you know hydropeg's amazing but some patients just don't respond well to it for whatever reason. We don't, we don't know why, but I definitely think there'll be some materials that help some of our patients that have ocular surface disease even more than, the, than they do today. Okay, excellent. Dr. Jed Licka. Yes, Craig. Would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, thanks for getting around to me eventually, by the way. I appreciate that. Um, you, were, you were in the top four. Well, let me tell you this, Craig, you look great today. Um, <laughs> um, you're definitely one of the two best hosts on this show. I will give you that much. And by the way, do I get a ding for Barry mentioning me in his comments? Because I think I should. I think that's... See, he agrees. Fine. Okay. All right. Cool ding. I, this is the only way I have a chance is to try to get brown nose points. Trust me. So. <laughs> uh, all right. So appreciate... Um, the comments already, and I'm not going to reiterate them because they're all spot on. Um, I, I do think that, you know, again, the instrumentation, uh, love to have instruments that are easier to use too. Uh, some, of the, some of the stuff we have now that helps is good, but it's time consuming and it's not always the best data every time. Um, also think that some of this virtual fitting applications we have could be a little easier for us to, to use. Um, but I also think that there's, there's got to be, I mean, it's like, what's the next new thing that changes the landscape? Because um, everything we're talking about now is taking what we already have and making it better. But what's, what's the new thing that we 
don't even see yet. And who's going to bring that to us? Where are the, which specialty lab or which company has the resources and the imagination to give us something new? Uh, we talked a little bit earlier today about, you know, is there potential to somehow still marry a GP and a, and a soft in a hybrid format that's completely different than what we've ever had, but still can bring the best of the two in a unique way that, that we don't even see right now? Um, that's kind of what I'm looking for is I'm, I'm thinking, what are the next new things? Again, could it be a material? Could it be, again, a, a coating that's just even, you know, better and beyond what we have now? Um, it's just, it's all about comfort and it's all about efficiency. And I, and I love the idea of the virtual fitting stuff. I mean, again, with, with COVID, we, and, and with the new laws and rules, you know, and the, the healthcare systems they want everybody to get away from reusing lenses i think that's just going to become a bigger and bigger part of this so okay that, that that's excellent i want to switch can, gears if i can just to, can hit the uh, okay, here. i did and now i'm going to hit this one you're done uh if we could all right we're going to switch gears here for just a second i know we already have talked about the the future uh, and in fact, if we look back at scleral lenses 10 years ago, we could never believe that they have revolutionized what uh, all of us here today uh, have done over the last few years. And of course, the many patients that have benefited from it. Scleral lenses took over for corneal lenses. And so I'm going to ask you, Dr. Barry Iden, uh, if we look at corneal lenses today, are they dead? Do you have any reason to go ahead and use corneal lenses today? I think it's a great question. And I have to be honest with you, uh, in my mind, we as contact lens specialty fitters, folks who have been doing it for years and years, uh, really want to find reasons and uh, times at which we still would use corneal GP lenses. It's getting harder and harder to make that decision with all of the other alternatives that are out there. So today, I would say yes. Uh, what are those times? Two things that I know. Number one, you want to have a, an irregular cornea that at least the, the apex of that cornea is more centered, right? So you know it's going to perform better in terms of positioning. And secondly, if cost is a factor to a patient, because we know that scleral lens costs uh, are significantly higher. Other than that, and maybe some of the exceptional cases of physiological compromise, like low endothelial cell counts in post-PK, uh, that we'd want to go there first. Other than that, really not. And are we trying to beat a sort of dead horse? Now, how many years ago was it uh, Nate Efron who said that they were dead? Or somebody said and they had yeah. a big argument with Ed Bennett. And I remember being there and listening to all of this. The truth is he probably was right. He was just off by a decade or so. So that's just the truth. Because I think as we move our technology forward, we will have less and less need corneal GP lenses. Fact of the matter, that's what's going to happen. Excellent. Dr. Jedlicka, what do you say? Uh, great question, Craig. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said uh, that too. I didn't get a ding. Oh, you did. That's why I said it, because I knew he gave you a ding <laughs> for saying that. Brownie points. That's the way to win, right? Um, so, so two things that I, I mean, I feel like if there were better options to replace these, um, they could go away too. But uh, multifocals, there's just something about a GP multifocal where you can get that translation of the optics that you're you're not going to get with simultaneous vision lenses. And so a corneal GP gives you the ability to have translating optics. And that does factor in. There are definitely patients who will do better with a multifocal GP, corneal GP than anything else. And then Excellent. I'm going to stop you there, Dr. Jedlicka. I'm going to stop you because you probably have run out of meaningful information. I'm going to go to Dr. Wu. <laughs> Steph, what do you think? Well, thank you, Craig, for, for asking. Um, I think it's an excellent question and something that actually Barry and I talked about, uh, I think it was last week on a panel with a few other contact lens people. And surprisingly, it seems like most of the eye doctors who are really into specialty lenses are the biggest proponents of corneal GP lenses. Um, I think that as my career has advanced, I have actually used corneal lenses more. And that's because of the 
maybe the thought of scleral lenses are super easy to fit. They, they just solve a lot of problems. But like Barry said, you have to think of patients that have corneal transplants, eye health issues. What if they've been wearing a corneal lens for many years? You're not going to switch a patient out of that, um, you know, is for the optics and, and the quality of vision. So I, I definitely think there's still a place, but I do think it takes a certain type of doctor to want to be able to fit that type of lens. Okay. It's, um, you know, a lot of the students and things, they, they don't have a lot of experience with that. That is great. Round one is over. Hate to cut you off, but it's really the best part of this job. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know, in the beginning here, we have a really kind of tight score here. I'll see if everybody can see that, but I will read it to you. That uh, Stephanie Wu, six points. Barry Iden, five points. Jason Jedlicka, four points. Oh. <laughs> I counted seven. I counted seven. I thought you had seven. That was an error. I was just jiggling. I was a little shaky because I haven't had any of that stuff that Barry Iden is partaking in and where <laughs> Stephanie, Stephanie Wu is right now. Well, you realize that, that I need that head start because I'm going to get blown away in the last segment. So, <laughs> Okay. So now we're going to move to our second question. And for this one, I'm going to start with Jason Jedlicka. Are smart contact lenses, and smart contact lenses meaning ones that have electronics built in, that are wearables, that, you know, can do magic as far as biometrology, you know, maybe measuring interocular pressure, uh, are they a viable option in this near future? And the second part of that, they're always referred to as smart contact lenses, but will they really be contact lenses at all? Are they just a chunk of plastic that we don't really fit? We just put on the eye and there's no fitting uh, to it. Jason? Uh, well, uh, by the way, Craig, you look great today. <laughs> um, in the limited amount of time that I'm sure you're going to give me, my answer is uh, yes, they're viable, and yes, they're contact lenses. Do I get more time? Okay. Um, I mean, there's still... Uh, You're over. And, You're done. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Stephanie Wu, what do you think about smart contact lenses? Yeah, so great question. This is something that does come up um, at TSLS a lot. This is, this is something that's come up for the past few years. And I definitely think there is a place for smart contact lenses. There are so many applications that this could have as far as registering tear film for diabetics or glaucoma or with Mojo, they posted a thing on, on the Washington Post or whatever about their technology about having some sort of low vision applications. So there's, um, I definitely think there's a lot of applications. As far as the contact lens portion, I think it'll be a little tricky because technically it is still something that you're wearing on your the surface of your eye. So it does need to be fit properly to make sure that the eye is healthy. Right. Don't you think, though, that there's the chance it'll just be a one-size-fits-all device? Mm -hmm. I mean, now, granted that that's not too different than many of the uh, single-use daily disposables, for instance. Um, so anyways, we'll see. That's a great comment, and I'm going to move to you now, Dr. Iden. Well, thank you, Craig. And let me first start by saying your wife is a beautiful woman, by the way. And um, that should be three dings, because Ursula really likes me a lot. Um, <laughs> so let's go. Ding me. Those are the dings <laughs> coming from the room next door. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so as it relates to smart contact lenses, uh, the truth of the matter is I'm not so sure it's really going to catch on. There are certain ones like Mojo, as you know, which are scleral lenses, which are going to obviously require significant fitting. Will patients really want to wear them? Will they be possibly just put on in an office or in a controlled environment where we can get these measurements and then take them off? Or will they be vision correcting as well? Will they be soft lenses? As some of us have already seen, soft lens technology is developing throughout the world for smart lenses as well. One of the more exciting things, in my opinion, 
are smart accommodating lenses, which can potentially address the limitations of multifocals that we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the future in terms of smart technology will not be a contact lens. Ultimately, it's going to be a tricorder, right? Just like from Star Trek. Why do you want to put anything on a person's body if you can hold something in front of them? We just got a bunch of non-contact thermometers because of COVID uh, for the office. They're amazing. I can't understand how it works, but it works. So I, I'm questioning that whole area from, from the smart portion. Okay, you're done, but you get one more for Star Trek. Excellent. Thank Dr. Jed Licker. Oh, I get a chance again? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree that the, that a lot of the things that we want to do with these smart contacts probably are better in a different realm, like Barry is saying. But I, I will say that when it comes to actual vision correction, specifically, the thing that contact lenses are made for, I do think there's some application in that regard for, again, accommodating lenses or lenses that can shift focus where they have like a, a liquid core or some type of autofocus system, you know, I think that that the potential for that is still there, but these are definitely going to be contact lenses then because they're, they're for vision correction. Okay. Excellent comment. That gets us through that round. Just as an update for you, Stephanie Wu, eight, not bad, not bad. Jason Jedlicka. <laughs> Six. And Barry Iden? Twelve, my friend. Twelve. Okay. We're going to have to apply a demerit to Jason Jedlicka. He's now down to five because it appears he's keeping his own score and challenging the host. That's verboten. verboten. Craig, you look great today, by the way. <laughs> You're back. Okay, if we could, just for a second, and, and if I could start with you, Dr. Iden, uh, this is sponsored by Oculus. You've worked with Oculus through the years. Can you say just a few words about your experiences with their instrumentation? I know you've been an investigator for them and looked at stuff before it comes to the market. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of us in our field, those of us who are out there lecturing all the time or writing all the time, uh, we get approached by companies to, um, in essence, represent them and, and maybe be on ad boards and so on and so forth. But I got to tell you, my story with Oculus didn't work that way. It was the opposite. I actually invested in their instrumentation first. And because I was so excited about it, I actually approached them and said, are there more things that we can do together? So I'm really proud to say that I made that move initially rather than them coming to me. And over the years, they've been an amazing company to work with. They really get it. They're all about excellence in terms of their technologies. Everything comes from that first. It's not marketing first. It's science first. And, you know, we started out with Pentacam. We've had Pentacam for over a decade now and um, then got our K5, our Keratograph 5, uh, and we're using both in the practice. Um, we've also purchased one of their Park Auto Refractors, and we also have been doing work with their, um, with their biomechanical instrument uh, in terms of measurement of, with, with Corvus. Um, I'm looking forward, to, as Stephanie mentioned before, uh, in terms of myopia management, you know, they're working on a system that's already being used in other parts of the world um, called Myopia Master, which incorporates auto refraction, auto keratometry, and biometry or axial length measurement. They get it, and they really are, in my opinion, honestly, a great, great organization. Okay, thank you. Really, thank you so much. Dr. Wood, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I definitely mirror everything Barry has said. Um, my practice was the opposite. We had the K5 first, and then we invested in the Pentacam about five years after that. But something that I really liked about the K5 was it was very user friendly. Some of the other topographers are a little bit more difficult to use or more uncomfortable for the patient, whereas the K5 is super easy. Um, another feature I loved about it was the dry eye component. So mm -hmm. looking at the meibomian glands, doing the nick butt, and being able to show the patient, hey, this is what's going on with your eye. Um, and then just the photography, so some of the anterior pictures and the uh, cobalt blue.
photos and videos have been super helpful when communicating with the lab. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you both for those uh, comments. Uh, that will take us up into our C block, as we say in the industry, uh, that we were going to do the entertainment portion of May I Interrupt. You as the viewer might have noticed there's a wine theme here today. Dr. Iden has got a bottle of wine behind him and one in his hand, a glass in his hand. Uh, Dr. Wu, you saw her just take a sip of wine and she's in her own little uh, wine area in her basement right now, as you can see behind her in that picture. And then of course, uh, Dr. Jedlicka majors in whining, so he fits right, right in to this whole <laughs> discussion. Wine, plenty. And uh, very wine, and, and not necessarily a well-aged wine either, I would say. That's the topic though, right? Whining? Whining. No, no, it was wine. Cool. <laughs> a whining. Yeah. yeah. Now you're wondering why, why you were invited. Okay. So <laughs> what, I, what I would like to do here is, and I'm actually going to start with you for a second if I, I can, Jason, and I'm going to let you ask a question of our two guests today, because you have said on a number of occasions, you like wine, but you don't know much about it. So do you have a question that you would like to pose to our two experts? And by the way, while you're thinking that over, uh, I'd like to mention to the audience also that both, both of our guests today are sommeliers, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, that they are in the study aspect of it. There's uh, Barry, if I have this correct, is a level one, and Stephanie is a level two, uh, and uh, we're going to ask them to be able to explain that also. And since Jason can't come up with a question, I'll just step oh. in for him and say, could you guys please explain the difference between a level one and level two? And I'll start with you, Barry Iden. Well, I, you know, I, I have to be honest, it all came from Steph. I mean, I've always loved wine for years and years, um, try to uh, gain some knowledge on my own. But it was Stephanie who went through her, um, her education. And I actually asked her, where did she, uh, where'd she get her education? And she kind of turned me on to an organization. I saw that the level that she had reached was obviously a lot more schoolwork than I was interested in. So with, <laughs> with my general nature. So I said, I think I'll take the easy way, just kind of like I, how I used Cliff Notes to get through high school. <laughs> Stephanie? Yeah, so the way I became interested is because I, I found wine very fascinating. And watching that documentary, Psalm, I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix, that was extremely interesting. Not that I wanted to go all the way to become a master sommelier because it takes way too long and you have to be in the service industry. But um, I looked up because there's, of course, courses online that you can just take and you are a sommelier. So I wanted to go through a legitimate company and doing a ton of research. There's actually only about three different organizations which are well respected in the wine industry. And so that's how I, we found the WSET, the Wine Spirit Education Trust. And then after I became level one, I quickly decided this is something really exciting and became level two about, I think it was four months later. And then I think that's when I talked to Barry and when we were in Las Vegas and we just, because of our passion for wine, just started talking more. And uh, then I just gave him some of the information and then he did it as well. Okay. That, that is great. And, and, and quite interesting. Jason, do you have anything? Uh, actually, have you thought yeah. of a question yet? No, no, if you let me talk, I do have an interesting question. <laughs> okay. You're done. By the way, Craig, you look great today. Um, so so I, I have a question for you. So when you read up on different wines and it talks about the different flavors that you can pull out of the wine, okay, the, the, the fruit flavors, the chocolates, the coffees, whatever it talks about, are those flavors native to the grapes or are they induced by the process or where does that come from? Where does that come from? Yeah, great question. Um, mostly it's from the, the wine barrels. So when the wine is aged, a lot of that comes from the actual barrels they're aged in or the grape varietal itself and the terroir, which is like the soil, 
the air, the climate, um, what happened that year to the grapes, what was the weather like. So it depends on kind of the region where the, the wine is from and then how it's aged. And in very terrible circumstances, there will be a wine company that actually puts chocolate in the wine, but those are like yucky, don't get those um, unless, <laughs> yeah, so don't get those ones. Get the ones where it's a natural type of flavor coming through. Are those the ones like in the rectangular bottles with the screw caps? Most likely. Okay. Barry, can you build upon what Stephanie just said? Say that again. <laughs> Dinged. <laughs> it's a process. It's a process. I'm sorry. Okay. So, Jason, ask your question one more time, please. Well, I, we were just talking about the, the flavors that you get out of a wine. And um, Stephanie was talking about how it's it could be the soil or the climate, the grapes, the barrels. Is there any other any other things that that can elicit or bring out a flavor in a wine? Well, yeah, I think she really did cover it all, um, you know, the grape varietals and everything relating to the grape. And the, as she mentioned, the terroir, the, the soil and the climate and all of those elements. And then, of course, you have the winemaker themselves and they have their own ways of doing things to enhance certain things. Um, what's really interesting is at certain places, certain wineries, the winemaker wants consistency, right? So they have a certain way they do it. And sometimes it's regulated, by the way, especially in old world wines. So, for example, if you are doing a Barolo from Piemonte, right, you have to do it a certain way. It's only one grape, has to be 100%, has to be from certain areas, certain little towns in the Piedmont area, has to be in barrels for X number of periods of time, in the bottle for X periods of time. Everything is absolutely regulated. Compare that to a lot of stuff going on in the new world, like even in Napa, Sonoma, you know, all of the places here where people can go crazy doing their own things because there's not that kind of regulation. And it really makes for more experimentation, but less uh, of a dependability, for example, because you know if you're going to get a Barolo, it's a Barolo, right? Or you're going to get, a, you know, something from the right bank in, in Bordeaux. You know what you're getting. So... <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. I just love Barolo. Don't know what it is, but I love the way you say it. And in the same way you talk about the land with Terrier. For Barolo. <laughs> Barolo. Barolo. <laughs> very good. And Barry, by the way, what did you shoot today? It looks like you just came off the golf course. No, I just praying. Our golf courses are all closed. Uh, they closed us down about almost two weeks ago. Uh, so now all they allow me to do is walk on my golf course, which makes absolutely no sense to me, because if I can walk on it, why can't I hit a little white ball um, with proper social distancing, but they don't allow me to do it. So I immediately got on Amazon and ordered a golf net, which should be here on Monday. So at least I can hit a ball to something. <laughs> well, the major difference would be if you were just walking on the golf course, you'd be going on a straight line. You wouldn't be going from way off to the left and way off to the right. Ding. That's a triple ding. <laughs> <laughs> that, very good. Okay. Um, how do you know, Dr. Wu, if a, lion, if a wine has gone bad? Excellent question. And the main thing is when you, when you smell it, it will smell kind of like wet cardboard. Um, it will smell really, really funky. And sometimes you can tell a wine is faulty if you pour it into a glass and it's really hazy. A lot of times that means that something has gone bad. Um, third thing is if you look at the cork after you take it, um, after you take the cork out, if there is a bunch of wine that has saturated the cork all the way to the top, that means that it's possibly oxidized. So too much oxygen has come in. And so that would be a way to kind of know right away that this wine might be bad. Okay, very good. That, you know, that's interesting because I noticed a cardboard smell about you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was good enough for a point. <laughs> 
that uh, that was good for a point. <laughs> that and so I did want to ask. So, so Jason, then when you come back from the liquor store, you do set the box aside for a day or two, and then you wipe off the cardboard on the outside before you open it up. Usually, it just depends on the first thing I have. Okay, great. Barry, what's the difference? Why do some people really like white wines and some people really like red wines? Yeah, that's really simple. Those who like red wines are definitely more sophisticated than those who like white wines. Now, I'm, I'm only kidding. Um, I think all of us who really get into wine start getting it more, in, you know, you usually start out with white wines. They're a little more approachable, a little easier to get used to. And when you first start drinking red wines, especially with the tannins, that kind of drying feeling, it turns off a lot of people. And so they tend to initially go to all these fruity, non-tannic wines. But as your palate gets more sophisticated, you kind of gradually go up. And, um, you know, I think most all of us, as we know, if you go to wineries, they always give you a glass of like Sauvignon Blanc as you walk in. But then they get serious and they go to the reds. So although whites can be very complex, surely the reds, at least in my mind, are really where it's at. Okay, that is great. One last question for you guys. Uh, what is your favorite winery? Jason will say Oliver Winery because it's just up the street from him. But I want to ask Dr. Wu first. They're local businesses, right? Yeah, so that's an amazing question. I, I, there's so many wineries, and I think that um, over time, your palate just, just changes, and you actually might love one one year, and then five years later, you might be completely turned off by that wine. But right now, one of my favorite wineries I visited in Napa recently was something called Promontory. Um, it's made by Harlan Estate and Bond. Those are like super high-end wines, but the architecture is absolutely beautiful. The wine style is beautiful. And anybody that's into red wines is, I mean, it, it would be their, their heaven. So that's one of my favorites right now. Okay. Thank you. Barry? So I'm going to divide it into two sections. Uh, one is the winery where I feel most comfortable and happy. And then the other is one of the most beautiful uh, that I enjoy going to. And both are in Napa. And we've been fortunate enough to travel the world um, and do it around wine. So we've been in lots of places throughout the world. In fact, we were just most recently in the fall in the Douro Valley of Portugal, which was absolutely gorgeous. But so there's a winery in Napa called Jessup. And the reason why Jessup has a special place in my heart is because one of the owners is in our ophthalmic field, a guy who is a phenomenal ophthalmologist, Vance Thompson. Um, and Vance is one of the owners. He has been so gracious. I've been there so many times. He has invited my kids who live out in San Francisco to go up. They brought their other sides of the family. So it's like a home away from home. And we just did, actually, our eldest uh, and my daughter-in-law just uh, celebrated a one-year uh, anniversary last summer uh, of their marriage, and we actually went to, they have a farmhouse uh, where they do a wine pairing and a luncheon for you. It was the most amazing experience. Another one in Napa that I personally love is one called a and Air, and it's way up in the mountains, and you look down over the valley. It's absolutely beautiful, and they make amazing calves and some wonderful blends. So, yeah, those are really special places to me. That sounds fantastic. Jason, you have anything to add to that? Look, I didn't think so. You look great today, Craig. <laughs> okay. That brings us to the end. As we look here, Dr. Wu, 18. Yay! Jason Jedlicka, 14. Wow, not bad. Damn. No, come back, really, for a yeah. box wine guy. Really, that was phenomenal. And Barry Iden, 18. We have a oh. tie. Oh, my gosh. So, I think. As it should be. As, as a it should be. As a tiebreaker, and I'm going to let Jason judge the winner here. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna ask each of you, what is the best $15 wine we can buy? Got to look that up. Yeah, they haven't bought a fifteen-dollar bottle of wine right. in years. You know, you know, my answer is always the same. I haven't either, but I haven't spent that much. That's why. 
My answer is kind of the same, Jason. It's two seven dollar and fifty cent boxes. <laughs> the two pack. <laughs> exactly. so there, there is one um, J. Lore. Their Cabernet from Paso Robles is really good. And um, so people that are into red wine, red blends would really like it. And it's a very low price point. Also, I think 14 Hands has a red wine that I, I think I saw at the grocery store that was $12.99. That is also a very good one. And one that my mom really likes right now is Bogle. And I think that's actually below $10, but she recently retired, so her wine budget has significantly, has significantly been reduced. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Barry? Yeah, I'm sorry. I lose. Wow. Oh, that's it? <laughs> oh, I think we know that. Nothing for you. <laughs> that's it. The winner is Stephanie Wu. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> and I have to tell you guys, that was fantastic. Before we sign off, Barry, I'm going to give you a shot at redemption. Do you have any closing comments? Closing comments? I think the three of you are all beautiful people. Aww. Each and every one of you. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Too bad the scoring is over, but we'll give you the bell anyways. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Stephanie? Um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. This was really fun and obviously an amazing topic that Barry and I are super passionate about and really good to be on with my good friend. And uh, just one advice that I actually got from uh, one of my friends in optometry school regarding wine. If you like it, drink more. If you don't like it, don't drink it. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Good advice. Jason Jedlicka. No, uh, first of all, Craig, you look great today, um, but no, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I appreciate Stephanie and Barry being here and sharing your thoughts with us. And um, I've learned plenty about wine as I did last episode about scotch. So we keep doing these, Craig. We're going to be smart someday. Yeah, no kidding. I, that's the hope. That's really the hope. Well, I want to thank all three of you that uh, really, Barry, you were great. Steph, you were great. Jason, you were mediocre. And, Hello. you know, that uh, I agree we, we learned something today also. I think in this crazy time we're living in right now, it's kind of fun to have a break like this. And we can't be together, but it's kind of like we're together uh, at uh, happy hour. Uh, and uh, I think I can't possibly, I think, actually have a nicer time to spend the last 35 uh, or 40 minutes. I want to thank all of our listeners, uh, both uh, uh, from myself and my co-host and friend and colleague, Jason, who I promise I'll be nice to the next time. Hey, Maybe. You 14 points. That's not so bad. Okay. Yeah, you're not bad at all. You got more than I did the last time. That's so I, was I, I, I do understand. I really want to thank Oculus for their support to be able to put this on. And echo the statements, of course, of our guests about the terrific instrumentation and, and what they offer to the field is really uh, so novel. And please stay tuned for more May I Interrupts uh, that we will continue on, Jason Jedlicka and myself. Uh, this will be available uh, uh, to view uh, on the Oculus website and also will be podcasted and one will be able to access that either on the Oculus website or through iTunes. Barry Iden, Stephanie Wu, Cheers. Jason Jedlicka, thank you guys. Be safe. Very lucky to have friends like you. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Take care. Cheers.